morning, one and all. Where should I stand? I'm here in the right. Can you do this for the city? I'm going to do the introduction first, and then you'll need to be one side so people can see it. Yeah, okay. Thank you for coming to the wilds of the Concert Bowls Club um, here in the park here. Um, we're actually sat on land that the uh, Concert Iron Works actually gave to Concert um, as well, so we're basically very much in the uh, area that still works as well. Um, me, as you can tell from my twang, I'm not a northerner. Uh, I've been up here, come up for eight years in November. Um, so basically, what we're talking about this morning wasn't even here when I got here um, eight years ago. Um, there was only one bridge remaining in the village that I live in, which is Leggate, um, and that was actually getting knocked down a couple of years after I got here as well. So there were no bridges left um, very quickly after I got here. Um, so um, yeah. I'm going to learn as much as you <laughs> uh, this morning. I've, I've been speaking on and off with Steve for some time, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and Steve has kindly um, provided us with some decent uh, blog posts for the website as well. Um, and we've always said that we'd love to have a, a, a chance to have a, a talk by him. Uh, but of course, that dreaded thing, COVID got in the way. Yeah, um, so yeah. basically, most of what we've been doing is online up to this day. So you may want to see us on Facebook. We've also got the, um, the website as well. Um, and all I would say to you is, we welcome any interactions with anybody that has got anything to um, record. Um, we're happy to scan photographs. We're not looking to take them away from you because they're, they're your memories and your photographs, etc. All we would ask for is the, is the chance to, to scan those and add them into the galleries on our website, etc. for future generations to see. The glory of the website is, is great because um, people leave their concert and their gate um, and go all over the world but they don't leave concert really. And I get messages like three o'clock in the morning from Australia, Canada, America, you name it, where people have moved to. Um, some of it was actually from work after the steelworks closing, etc., um, and even over to Teesside and so forth, where some of them are still just about going still uh, over there in one way or another. It's fascinating for me to actually see the heritage that's built up around the steelworks and then the infrastructures around that and part of that is the railways. Um, but again, they were thriving bits of all the communities, because basically from Leggate, for example, you'd go all the way to the coast on the railway at one point. Um, and I've seen some lovely photographs, like a fit of real, um, for example, where the track went eight different ways. And even when I walk on the cycleways, which is basically all that's left of the yeah. railways from I moved into the future here, um, <coughs> the track's been pulled up and so forth. As you go down towards Brooms, uh, opposite the uh, Jolly Drovers there, um, literally just before you get to the cemetery there, I didn't even know this until I went on a remembrance walk with somebody. Um, the track would have gone straight up to South Mendham, up to the pits there. So it's driven by the industry, so it's driven by the coal mines, it's driven by the steelworks to get materials and products there. And the passage, so I was like a secondary aspect of that, really, is really mm -hmm. driven mm -hmm. by um, that. So um, I'm going to leave Steve to read on, I don't know too much about his length of service and so forth, I'm sure he's going to cover that in his talk. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm sure he'll welcome any questions that I certainly will, you know, uh, yeah, as well. Yeah, uh, I've got some artifacts to have a look at. Mm. We're going to stop sort of at a natural space at some point, yeah, so well. people can have a, a cup of tea or whatever. So, you know, um, <laughs> we're looking to support the Vols Club, thank goodness the use of this lovely facility as well. Uh, so thank you for coming in over the stage. Yeah, thanks very much, Richard. Mm -hmm. As I say, thank you very much, Richard, for inviting me up here, and Peter with his equipment. Well, uh, good good morning still, it's still good morning, isn't it? So, I'm Steve, Steve Shields, and um, the railway's been my career from when I was 17, and well, actually I'm still working part-time now uh, for West Coast Trains at Canford, they're a charter company. But, at the time when I was up at concert, I did six years up here as a freight train guard, and I came back later on as a relief signalman. For some reason, uh, it was, which when I look, look at me overall, 50, it'll be 53 year service in September this, this year, September the 29th, that's when I started. But for some reason, coming up here, even though it was only a small part of my railway career, it was the most important part, because by being one of the lads, that's all I was, I started as a temporary goods board, a number taker in Newcastle, in 69 at the goods yards, then I went to train yard as a lad messenger, when I was 18 I came out as a young guard. I was the youngest guard ever to be a tiny yard from what I was told. I was 18 in the February, I was out in the May working as a guard. And one of the first jobs that they put you on was learning concert. Concert I know, tiny doctor concert on the I know trains. 
and uh, once you did two trips, or you, once you signed two routes, you became, you became a fully fledged guard. So I think it went from 13 pounds 17 and 6 to 14 pounds 17 and 6. You, you got an extra quid for being a professional guard. So, as I say, it only played a small part in my railway career because when I left here, I didn't want to leave here because I was a six years as a guard, came back as a signalman, and my late ex wife, God rest her soul, we'd only got married in the September of 79. And in the November, well, we all know what happened in 79, they announced that the works was closed. We just took a mortgage on, well, it was going to close the following year. And I thought, what am I going to do? Uh, luckily, I was transferred to Ferry Hill on the main line in the beginning of 1980, but it was the May of 1980. And from there, I did a few years of relief signal on the main line. Fully, I came back up here in its dying days, before that was all gone. And then I decided to be going to the inspector, signal inspector. And I'll skip ahead a bit here now. I ended up as a signaling manager, which was basically like an area operations manager for Teesside. And I got the chance to get away. Privatisation was not what I liked. It was it was bad. It was like everything else that was privatised. Uh, it did to, to us, the rail industry, what they'd done to you lads. I'm saying you lads. I take a you were all ex steel workers, are you lads? We, we the steel works, are you? Not quite, no. Well, <laughs> alright, okay, we're the ones that are, oh, anyway, you know. And then they decided to demolition of the. Um, the coal industry, but not to talk about politics, I'm not ready for that. So I got the chance to get out, and as I say, work part time. So altogether now, with my service, 53 years, but it's this part of the service, the six years as a young guard coming up here and a relief signalman, that I feel like was an apprenticeship for the rest of my life to handle blokes, to, to listen to people. So I was just an ordinary railway guy. I didn't wear a suit, not like that. And uh, I, thank, I, thank, I thank the Lord that I actually came up here and got that training that set me up for the rest of my railway life. That's how I see it anyway. So, it's now the spring of 1970 and I'm a young guard. Life is a young guard. Life, life is a guard. It was, the health and safety boys would have loved it. We wouldn't have been allowed up the yard these days. You got in, you got in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, the, the, the uh, yard inspector or the yard supervisor give you your orders, uh, your um, it could be on mineral trains, I'll come back to that in a minute. It could be on the steel trains coming out the, out the low yard, or you could be on the iron ore. If we had our days in 1970, life would have been much easier, but there was no such thing as back to back radios in 1970. It was hand signals and knowing what each other did. We just knew we worked as a team, driver, fireman, guard. We went into these colliery sides at two o'clock in the morning, black dark, we were tripping over bloody signal buys and uh, excuse me, orange, and, uh, and you know, everything else. So you went into the yard, you prepared your train, and then you went into the guards van. The driver by this time was sitting in a lovely warm cab, class 37 or wherever it was, diesel. We were in 1870. It was 1970 on the calendar, but it was 1870 uh, in reality. You went into the guards van, no fire, coal fire. No lights and oil tail lamps. Oil side lights. And we've just moved from oil hand lamps to bardic lamps. Things with the batteries, battery operated bardic lamps. So uh, you had to actually start looking around for coal in the yard. You've got your van filled up with coal. You've got the fire on. It will burn. I'll show you some photographs just now. Uh, in fact, Go straight to them pictures now, John. I'm trying. <laughs> I don't know whether my battery is just give like. it up. So I'm setting the scene of what, what, uh, what we did anyway. You know, so. I'm going to have to sit in. Modern <laughs> technology. Fantastic. Yeah, well, I've got some more batteries <laughs> with me, but I thought it would be um, Lady Zerlin, but she just doesn't want to at the moment. Well, I'll speak in the meantime. Anyway, so we eventually got the van fire going. Sometimes, I know this, this is it. The first redesigned dish should be made to travel in it. This is a London Midland Scottish LMS brake van, and they were absolute ice boxes. You could have a blast furnace in there, and it would still never warm up. And they're basically uncomfortable, you sat in this little cubby hole here, there's a flat piece of wood with a bit of plastic nailed on it, but there you go, that's inside. This is life in, in a brake van as a young guard of 18. No lights, handbrake, no back to back radios, brake and road for coal, there's the, there's the stove there, there's the stove there. And 
And some days, no matter how many times you try to get the damn fire to light, it wouldn't burn. There's a little pullman here, which one or two of us put together for van fires. And it says here, put my glasses on over. <laughs> if you want an electric fire, please, please raise the stovepipe. This was a piece of Kilroy style writing that would often be seen on inside the wall of a guard's van, usually behind where the stovepipe and chimney was fitted. The reference to what an electric fire was there when the particular guard's van would be working on overhead live wires, and by raising the stovepipe and making contact with a 25,000 volt wire, you would definitely warm the guard's van. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was that. So anyway, as I say, these are the LMS ones. Plenty of awful things, ice boxes, no light, could wash your hands, so when you put coal in the fire, you were also eating your bait with the same hands that you had put the coal on as well. Thankfully, uh, we didn't travel in them very often, and uh, we, uh, we had the northeastern vans. Show us a photo of the northeastern vans. I haven't got one of the northeast. Oh, no. right. Oh, well, yeah. You sent me that, but I haven't yeah, done right. it. Oh, that's, I'm sorry you didn't know that, didn't you? Anyway, the northeastern vans were a completely different thing altogether. They were much more compact, and uh, uh, they were much more better ride. They were, much more, they were just better than up together. But sometimes even them fires wouldn't light. So what we used to do was a detonator trick. And we used to put a detonator, we used to carry in these emergency detonators for when the train was derailed or failed. And the, and the thing was, we had a bit of a glow on the fire, you put the detonator in, get out on the veranda. <laughs> and you just wait until it cleared, because when the detonator went off, it went up through the chimney, and you, in theory, should have cleaned your fire. And I remember one journey from Tiny Yard to York, we went via Washington. And by the time we got to Paylor, it was rubbish, wasn't burning. A bit of cold March, begin the March 1971. And I thought, I'll put the detonator in. And what was left of the flames, I put the detonator, I went outside on the veranda. And I looked, and I was looking through the window there, and it gets the fence hoses, and it gets through Washington, sorry, the fence hoses, gets to Ferry Hill, we're going towards York. And, and I, I, I finished, I went, I was trying to go in because the blue thing blew up my face, you know. So I opened the door and I got on it, and there wasn't one piece of paint burnt off the detonator. It, it had never made any difference at all. And I froze the rest of the way, the rest of the way to York after that. So this is what they were like, 1870. You might have well took a photograph in 1870. The drivers were sitting there, the steam engines had gone, steam had gone, and they were sitting there, kind of tea on the morning. You'd walk around your train, you were freezing, you'd freezing your lugs off with the camera. And, uh, <laughs> And, and that's the conditions that we worked under. So, you hear that. So, now, a little other, other, other poem which I'll mention here is how both the drivers and guards what thought of each other. And I've got here, the guard is the van. The guard is the man who rides in the van and travels at the rear of the train. The man at the front thinks the guard is a grunt, and the guard thinks he is the same. <laughs> I'm obviously cleaning that up a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, yeah. So I'm just, uh, I'm just occasionally refer to this, so I know where I'm at. Uh, so next to the drink ones. Yeah. So we came up the concert with uh, three trains. I know, coal, and empty bogey bolsters to the lower yard where the steel came out. Now the I know trains they were often tied up them days, and uh, a typical I know diagram, and it worked right round the clock when the boats were coming in. Uh, give an example, 0, 0125 in the morning, out of the yard, down to the Tyne Dock, uh, turn the train round, nine, or cars, these are the old, uh, tip, the old wagons that were built in 1956, and would get down to the Tyne Dock with empties that were brought back from concert, put a couple of the engines, round about, <coughs> shove them under the gallery, the Tyne Dock, and there was a white disc, in fact, if you can shoot to the iron ore trains, John, the Tyne Dock, there you go. So we're on the, this is the dock. These are the wagons, these are the 56 tonnes. When they were loaded, they were 56 tonnes. And, uh, can't we, see the disc on there. The There's one with the disc on there now. There, there it the is. is there. Now these are, these are the 9Fs. We didn't know the 9Fs. Steam had gone by the time I come on about 18 months earlier. So we had to do we had the class 24 days. That's the way it is. That gave you permission to set back under the gallery. And the Tyne dock lad was down there and he would tell you where to stop because there was a treadle where the first wagon would um, need to be. Excuse me. So at the given point, 
provided all your safety catches were in the doors, you soak the bunker and a massive wash of iron ore would fly into the wagons. And uh, you would sign a paper and we were good to go. Now, if the lads that were on the works can remember there was different types of iron ore. And the tool I remember was the powder stuff <laughs> and there was the pellets, the iron ore pellets. You can still say the pellets are all the way from South Paler Junction. There's dozens of them on the truck side. Oh, the footpath is it is now. So, um, oh, for go. Now, the 9Fs, they were the engine for the job, but as I say, they'd gone earlier on. And uh, the two Darlington built Type 2s, they were at the limit. They were at the limit. 920 tonne was the full load of the iron ore trains and the two engines from the dock bottom. You came up to Tyne Dock, you were on a heavy graded 140, I think it was more or less, straight away. You got up to Bolton Curry, and uh, you got to the straight then. Through uh, Fellet Felling, uh, up through Tyne Yard, through Ocean Junction, and then you start climbing. 12, 13 miles up the concert. And the two Type 2s were, as I say, were at the limit. 1 in 55, when we were approaching Beamish, the gradient. A wet rail, you know, the wrong kind of leaves, and you would see the train slowly start to slow down. We weren't going very fast anyway, but you're doing about 15 miles an hour. And it was like a fruit machine in one of these uh, amusement arcades. You had blue light, engine stop, yellow light, wheel slip, Red light, no, blue light, high water temperature, yellow light, wheel slip, red light, engine stop. And all of a sudden, the fire bell would start ringing because they were overheating, because that, that ninth wagon was always one too many for the, for the Type 2s. So the fire bell would start ringing, and we'd cure that by putting a piece of paper in it. It's <laughs> true. And all of a sudden, the engine would come to a stand. So we had to wait, let them cool down, restart, hopefully and then try again, you know. And we only got to 155. By the time we got to Shale Row, where it levelled out, and you got to a gallop, you think you were doing 100 mile an hour on the curve there, but you went around the curve at West Stanley, and you were 1 and 35. Well, they were, they were just about ready to blow up by then. But if you could keep them going, and you could get over the top of Greencroft, you were on, you're on your own slide, you know, don't know what, South Meadows, you're on the corner, and uh, up onto the gantry, where we're all right then, you know. If we could be lucky, we would not one out because because we're getting on by 1970 these wagons, and they were prone to broken springs, and a lot of trouble with the springs. So if we could be lucky to get not one out, carry the wagon lad at the high yard, would come or maybe stand up, carry the wagon lad, not one out, we would sail at the bank with eight on, not a problem. Now then, we will get the concert, we'll get the orders to go out to the gantry, the gantry that uh, I don't know, John, I thought right now. What oh, passing fed was there now? If we can get to the gap, you'd concert, please. Yeah. yeah. When you get to it. Just a, a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's. There's thousands of slides, you know. I don't, I don't want to keep every, go on every slide, but we'll get to the ones up by that. Let's push it myself. Yeah, keep going. Come here. I'm not paying attention to you. So. There's a razor grain you bought. That's the kind of one, right? Okay, so it gives you an idea. There you go. What we had. 55, 49, uh, 1 and 30, 5 8, 7 8, Stanley. Uh, catch points, now that's an interesting thing, I'll tell you about catch points. Catch points were put in on rising gradients. There was 14 sets of catch points between Ooson Junction and Greencroft Summit because of the loose couple of trains that we used to take up with the possibility of them breaking away and running back down into the path of another train that was coming up the bank. So 14 sets of catch points. So if you did conk out, if you did break down, you had to make sure you didn't break down over a set of catch points, because if you start rolling back, you are going to be derailed, which did happen. Uh, anyway, the, 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 the gantry truck. There you go, these are, this is the jobs that I was on. These are the Darlington built tattoos, and there you go, he's on his way to concert. He's approaching SP13 signal at South Paler Junction, that's where he is there. And we're just about to hit that. Uh, this is in the days of steam at South Paler. Uh, and this is passing South Palo, and he's got a banker on the back here because some of, the, some of these steam engines had bankers to get them extra to show. We never had bankers on the um, on the days that we just managed quite well. To, to to manage. Uh, that one there was the last train, the last I know train hauled by steam, the one before. Did you that was on there? Yeah, I just have to find the arrow. Come on, cross. There you go. I've got to know that 
Tiny Yard, very, very well. The works, Tiny Dog Feynman, uh, keep him a name check. Morris Warbray, um, Freddie Price, Alan Wobbett. You remember Frank Wobbett, the radio presenter? Well, that was his brother. And they were young Feynman, the Tiny Dog, before the ship closed. And they made sure that the last steam hauled that I know train was given a real old send off. So this was 92063, the loco, which was scrapped, which was a shame. But there you go. There, and there's one of the Type 2s there. And uh, that South Pingler, this is a load of empties coming off the bank. Uh, he's bit a concert and he's on his way back. And that's Stella Gale. Big coal exchange signs at the bottom of the bank from uh, concert. Uh, and this is the colliery. Uh, sorry, do you want to go back? Uh, no, I keep going, all right. And this is the. Uh, oh, I'll come back that story later on. That's, 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 that's <laughs> a tail and a half after. Uh, yeah, up to the gantry, John. Up to the gantry. Right. Gantry. We'll come back. Where to go to get the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for Anfield, West, Catch Point, South, Medanty, Bradley, Car House, and then onto the Gabby. Anyway, good go. Is that million, isn't it? Now eh? yeah, it oh, we'll comes close enough. Uh -huh. Anyway, this is the high yard, last trip to concert, concert station. There we go, right. Okay, so this is the gap. He's, he's actually finished his road there now, and he's actually coming off the second water. Uh, as you know, the, the, what was the old oh, gantry was around the corner here, where you discharge your. Just next one, John, so okay. There you go, this is him uh, arriving. Now, then, dear, they used to pull the steam engine onto the gantry. When we went there, we used to propel. Once, once we got there, we would speak to the Constantine Company lad. And we'll go around, check the safety catches at the doors, because the safety catches uh, were there to stop the doors. We're like a DeLorean car, they were gold wing these doors, and they could easily open uh, if the safety catches went in, if the pressure uh, dropped on the train. The pressure was worked by a Westinghouse uh, compressor from the two engines on the front. It was a vacuum brake train, uh, that was what the brake system was, it wasn't an air brake train, it was a vacuum brake train, but they had this Westinghouse uh, apparatus on the engine. Which, when we got onto the gantry, put the safety catches off, they told us to propel back on the gantry. We stopped, and I would sit there, constantly, I'd come to lad. Tell us when you're ready, I'd like, okay, guard. So I said, just, there was no radio, so we just went like this, good Harry work, you know, like that, you know. Up the doors, and the doors, you, the driver would turn this valve, and in theory, and I mean in theory, the doors should open, and the iron would cascade onto the belt below. Well, sometimes it stuck, especially the powder stuff used to stick. And the health and safety boys would never have let any of you lads come near the place now because they used to sometimes, and I've seen them, get in, they'd climb into the wagons and they'd be having with these steel bars to get the bloody stuff to, to free. I mean, well, if the slip that had come up was a piece of steel because it was on the conveyor, I don't know, 20, 30 feet below, uh, eventually they got the stuff out. Now the iron bots, the, I think it was called Kasinga from the body, these little pellets, they used to fly up there, that wasn't a problem. But the powder, when it was raining, Took forever to get the damn stuff out sometimes. Anyway, we'll get the stuff out, do this to the driver, he shuts the doors, we'll come off. There's the Northeastern Railroad, there's one of the better vans, there you go. Much better van, you wouldn't think so, but it is, I'll tell you now. And uh, anyway, so we just discharged the ore and we'd go back to Tyne Dock uh, with the empties. And um, it all start again, you know. And we thought, sorry, dear. But if we couldn't go a complete stand on the way of going up and we were total failure and we couldn't do nothing, wouldn't restart, uh, there was no mobile phones, as I said, MJ, there's none of that. So you had to walk to the nearest telephone box, which could be in the middle of nowhere, especially when the signal boxes were closed during the night between South Pelo and Car House, because uh, you used to what called switch out. So there's big long 12 mile block sections where if you did conk out, you had to walk to try to find a public phone, ring the Newcastle Control, where my mate used to be in there, and say, this is the guard of 6K48, I've failed completely in Beamish. And then they would try to ring for the fresh engine, the assistant engine. One of us would go back and carry a full protection, 
stand there with a the red light until the assistant engine came in, bang, 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 took the detonators on the back of the train and then shove us up to the gap concert. But that only happened now and again, I guess. So as I say, if you could get one knocked off, you used to sail up the bank with uh, eight on, but nine, the type twos were, oh, it was terrible. So hear the fiber ringing, you know, and, the, and then sometimes we'd get off me and the firemen because we'd done it three miles an hour, and if it was a wet rail, we'd be putting sand down in front, we'd go, the bloody trails come behind us. Uh, you know, the, the, we kept going, we kept the job going, that's what we did then is, you know. So that was really the I know, the I know trains. And then we had the coal, which had to come to the furnaces up the high yard. Now that was another, interesting thing because we had a lot of mineral turns at Tiny Yard. Uh, there was a mineral diagram. It started at uh, 5.35 in the morning. In fact, it was 12 volts. And uh, mineral, typical mineral bill would be going to the train inspector's office and you'd look at the little fellow with a pipe, Jimmy Taylor, and I'd say, where are we going this morning, Jimmy? We didn't know where we were going on the min mineral turns. At least for the I know, you knew we had a, what we call the diagram. But with the mineral turns, you didn't know where you were going until you got into the office. You, you write this down, Mineral Control, Newcastle. Uh, right, this is the train that's got the tiny yard. Where do you want these lads? Engine van to Low Fell Sidens, 35 empties to Pensher Colliery, or Pontop, or Wardley. Load a double Lexus to South Paler for concert, for the Fell Sidens. So off we go to Pensher Colliery. Actually, I'm from Pensher. I, I, live in, I used to live in Pensher, that's where I was bred, born and bred over there. And you knock the van to one side, and you come out, 24 heavies, 32 ton each, and you put the van brake, sorry, put the van on the back, put the engine in the front, and that was it. That was the only brake you had was the straight air brake on the engine, the 50 ton brake force, and the guards van. You had a thousand ton between the two, two you know, vehicles, the van and the, the engine. But some lads, they, some of these drivers, uh, I never would ever know who they really did because they knew, they knew the weight of the train, you had to harm the train. We very rarely had signals pass, we call them spads these days, so that's when you get signal pass to danger, that's what it stands for. But I very rarely remember signals being passed, and this is, this is with an unbraked heavy coal train. Anyway, never mind, we'd get the South Paler, and the, the mineral bill would say, load the South Paler, reduce. So we used to do two trips, uh, night shift, any, any time, we'd say it was two or three o'clock more. You get off the guards van, no radios, black as your hat. So you had to be in a position where you could see your driver and he's looking out there and there might have been a fireman on board and you, you're waving him forward, you're waving him back with a lamp. And sometimes, you know, you, you wonder if you're seeing your like. And I say the health and safety boys, well, we would never have been allowed to leave the yard these days, to be honest with you, you know. It would have been an assessment, doing a risk assessment. Oh, you can't go, you know. The water would still works, the water cold. Oh, well, that would you know, find somewhere else to go, really. And, uh, Anyway, uh, what was up to there? Um, right, so we'd uh, take the first load of the concert up to the high yard, split the train, take the vote seven up. Uh, maximum load with the coal train with a class 37 in the English electric type three was 550 tons because of the gradient. So we'd get to the high yard, get up to the high yard, uncouple, uh, round about we'd go, and your lads, I'm saying your lads, you know, concert line company lads, we'd be waiting and they would cook up to the stuff we brought in and they would take straight into the fell sidings what we call the fell sidings, just down from the station on the right hand side and from there we used to see them disappear around the corner and probably straight into the furnace or something like, you know, and, uh, and then uh, another, then we'd go engine and van, pick the guards one up go back to South Paler, do the same thing again and then back to the high yard, once again straight into the fell sidings and then there'd be the empties that them lads had emptied out uh, in the high yard, we had 35 empties Usually 35 empties was the maximum uh, amount of wagons that we could take up the high yard. So, went on the train, we're up to the train now, 35 empties back to Low Fell. The thing was a continuous merry-go-round. You say empties to the quarries, coal, open concert, empties back down. That's the way it worked. Now then, empties, we've got within engine, let me say, no, let me say, we've got 35 empties, what do we say, about 500 ton, about 400 ton. Yeah, remember that then? So you've got no brakes, you've only got the guards one brake and the locomotive brake. Off we go from Concert High Yard, we're down through Leadgate, we're up through the Pastor Jolly Drovers pub. We're on our way up towards Greencroft Summit. Now there was a breaking point at Greencroft Summit. This is open to debate. Some of us used to get off, walk to the front of the engine and start putting hand brakes down. There was a bit of a curve at Greencroft Summit, so you lost sight of your driver. And he was moving forward and 
So the rule was that the, the new we had of brakes when the train, was sort of the engine, had to actually pull on the uh, regulator of the diesel. Once you knew that, the train should stop because the wagon brakes are actually pulling the train to a stand. Some of us used to stop at Anfield, Disco Bridge, but <coughs> just before you get to where the uh, supermarket is at Anfield, I don't know if it's still there, but if it was uh, there, it is, yeah. is it? Right, yeah. And then if we thought we had enough brakes off, we'd go past Anfield East, and then down, down around the 1 and 35, Shield Row, we levelled out a bit there, it was called Stanley Level actually, that was its proper name, Stanley Level. You could get off there, and if you felt like you needed to adjust them, you could. If not, you were then at Alton Towers, down the ski slope. You were down there, the one and th you were really on your way down the back there. Now, and it's 35 empties, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm sitting in the brake van, and I'm thinking, oh, God, we're going up brakes. And we're looking down, and Alton described it as like said, Elmo's fire effect of the brake blocks, and this cascade of fire coming down the bank off the brakes that were applied, you know. Down through Babish Woods, <coughs> through the tunnel of Babish, through the Babish Woods, down towards Pelton, around the curve, down towards South Palo. This is where it gets interesting here. Bear in mind you've got a few hundred ton there, and you want to be straight down to Tiny Yard or wherever you've got to go over the wagons. Then just, you're coming down, there's a signal around the corner, and it's a, it's a signal which is controlled from South Palo, but operated by the next box, which was Tiny Yard, the power box. If that light was green, you knew that you were clear straight down onto the down slope and you were all right but if the light was yellow it meant that the next one around the corner was red and it meant that you had a train coming in off the main line from Durham now if you couldn't stop then your next port of call was the sand drag itself pilot sand drag was it was a length of rail or a section of track rather where if you couldn't stop you went past the signal of danger that you should have stopped that and the whole of the train is goes into this sand truck basically and it, it derails you. Derails you. It's one way of stopping it, I suppose, anyway. So we used to pray to God that we'd get a green light in that signal and off we'd go, you know, and then we'd take the train into the tiny yard or but yeah, another quarry for the next trip. Uh say to the pants stuff. You always thought you had enough brakes down, but sometimes the drivers would let, would let them run a bit and you think, you know, is, is he is he running because he can't stop, or is he running because he's got control? It was always a bit of a worry, like, you know? So that was your mineral, <coughs> that was your mineral trains. And finally, that one, finally, next one was, um, was the, uh, was the right, the stale line. So we had, we had a lot of turns at Tain Yard, um, where we just used to move the empty bogey bolsters from Tain Yard up to Consit. Uh, 15 bogey bolsters, uh, empties. Up to the up to the law yard, down to the law yard, push them in, and uh, I'll come back in a minute. And as you went past the signalman at the law yard, he used to get his orders from the law yard inspector, uh, Wilson Robson. You will remember there was a family called the Robson, the a big railway family in Constant in them days. And um, it was Lyle Wilson, Brian was the nephew, he was the driver at Tain Yard. And I would say, Where was you want this P31? He was the engine. Uh, van on one, engine up two, load on three. So you wanted the brake van on number one road, which was where your load was to bring, uh, bring out of the uh, works. Engine on that. Load on two, that's where your, uh, that's where your empties were going. And your engine round about to go onto the front of your trailer that you've got to bring out. So we did that, go around about. And the maximum load you could bring out of the law yard with bogey walls of steel, your plates, your steel plates, <coughs> was 780 ton. 780 ton. There was 780 ton coming down Concert Bank. There's no way in a million years that you're going to stop. So these wagons were uh, vacuum braked. So it, your life, literally, your life depended on it because you had shipyard steel, the Swan Hunters, Walkers, uh, that was on the tide, uh, Doxford, in Sunderland, Austin Pickers Guilds. We used to take that steel down to Tain Yard and the next trip, the next day, the local pilot would be running the steel up with me here down to the Riverside branch on the uh, St. Peter's, down that way, the following day, Swan Hunters, uh, Walker Yard, Naval Neptune Yard, that was on the time. On the other side of the river, the way, uh, there was Austin Pickers Guilds, Deptford's, where they were building the SD-14 bull carriers. So this is what it was like, you know, the, the seal came out and went straight to where it needed to go. Uh, anyway, so we relied on the yard, constant yard stuff, Law yard stuff to find as a what we used to call a brake head. So, say if you had 
I know it's a 10 or 12 bogey bolts is loaded. That was 780 tonne, the maximum weight you could get out of the lower yard. We needed at least, and they were a good half of them, at least half of them, for the brakes to work, these vacuum brakes. Not hand brakes, the vacuum brake where the blocks came on and the driver could feel that like he had a brake coming down the hill. So they used to do a good brake test, check that all the brake blocks were binding on. And then when the time was right, which would come out of the lower yard, down towards Black Hill, and the signal would come off, and he'd give us a good push to get us up the gradient from Concert North round by Concert East, Owens Gill, where the tanks used to go, the oil tanks, and eventually would be, the engine would drop off at Concert Station, and he would come back down to the shed, and we'd be on our way for that. And uh, we'd get, as I say, the same route, through like getting down a bit, come down the gradient there, and he'd put the van brake on, touch the old van brake, and uh, you could tell by that time whether he needed any extra brakes. And if he did, I would, I would get up and put a few hand brakes down. Uh, but once again, you were always hoping that that signal down at Oakson Junction would be showing a green aspect because being a few lads run away, uh, the concert branch of all the railways that were worked over, you had to treat that with the greatest of respect because it would come back and bite you. And if it did, it was likely to be kill you, you know, because you never get a second chance with a runaway train, you know. Uh, so we're lucky that never happened, we always got back safe. Uh, so that was really the, the main three trains that we did there. Um, at this point, do you want a break? Uh, so yep, so we're going to do a glass of water, actually. If you feel that way, I'd be... Everybody for a cup of tea? Yeah.